my name is Dr. Nate Nye, and um, what I am going to do, uh, Dr. Dreher, is I am going to share my screen for just a minute, and um, we will be able to introduce our speaker. So, uh, Dr. Dreher is a uh, primary care sports medicine physician and uh, uh, up at Johns Hopkins University. We appreciate you joining us, uh, Jeff. Uh, Dr. Dreher did his uh, residency in family medicine and his sports fellowship uh, just outside of, uh, outside of Philadelphia and, uh, and then joined the, uh, the faculty there at Johns Hopkins University where he, um, he uh, helps teach the residents and medical students as well as um, uh, sees a lot of clinic out there and he is a team physician for the, uh, the Johns Hopkins University Blue Jays. Dr. Dreyer brings a background with exertional dyspnea. He actually um, went through this as a patient himself uh, as a young athlete and uh, had to go through the, uh, the process of treating and managing asthma as a young athlete and later in his residency performed uh, a research project to uh, to help get uh, increased education regarding asthma. So uh, Dr. Dreher recently spoke uh, to our uh, local regional consortium uh, at the Army 10 miler on this topic and uh, was very well received. So you're in for a great talk. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dreher. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing and uh, let you go ahead and reshare your screen. All right. Well, Dr. Nye, thank you uh, very much for the nice introduction, uh, as well as the uh, invitation to uh, present this lecture um, for the fellow series. Uh, and as discussed, we're going to go through and talk about the uh, difference between asthma as well as exercise-induced uh, bronchoconstriction today. Um, if I can, there we go. I do not have any disclosures. Uh, injectives of our talk today are kind of review uh, different differential diagnosis for exercise induced dyspnea, uh, as well as different considerations. Uh, but then we're really going to focus on the non emergent airway causes in athletes and otherwise uh, healthy individuals. Uh, and then we're going to go through and differentiate mainly between asthma as well as exercise induced bronchoconstriction or EI. Uh, and at the end, we'll also touch briefly about uh, EILO or exercise induced uh, laryngeal obstruction. So, exercise induced dyspnea uh, can be a common cause of uh, concern as well as a complaint in an athlete. And it can have a wide range of complaints from uh, mm -hmm. being specific to needing to catch my breath. Uh, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, or a little bit more uh, vague terminology where they're discussing fatigue or underperformance. And these are areas that we need to uh, consider, uh, as well as focusing on the history to figure out the clues that might lead us to uh, a specific diagnostic track. Um, but keeping your mind open for the dyspnea, when we talk breakdown uh, to five different areas of causes. Uh, first one being that jumps to the mind is usually the respiratory system. And so that's where we're going to talk and focus today on uh, some of the common pulmonary causes uh, from airway kind of hyper responsiveness, but also considerations for the oxygen transportation. So cardiac as well as um, blood or even anemia as a consideration for transporting the oxygen throughout that can cause uh, increased respirations and fatigue. Uh, working muscle considerations, structural considerations. We're looking at scoliosis, rib or chest pathology, uh, as well as some psychological causes and kind of how to tease, tease those apart potentially. Um, so having an athlete come in with a complaint, I need to stop frequently to catch my breath, or maybe he's not performing as well uh, next to his teammates or counterparts. And so that's when you're looking at the history and you wanna really try to clarify these uh, vague terminologies and ask some specific questions to fully understand the complaint, uh, as well as find out what's going on with the exercise uh, and kind of target a diagnostic plan. Um, and so here is a, a, a large slide with a lot of differential diagnoses to consider. Uh, and it's not meant to scare you, but just kind of to keep an open mind. And we'll talk about kind of each one of those um, 
considerations for causes we talked about. So first, again, the respiratory system that jumps to our mind, the common ones that we're going to go into a little bit more depth, but the asthma, EIB, EILO. Uh, but also in this same airway path, uh, pathway, you want to think about pulmonary embolism. So especially if you have a female athlete who might be on birth control, cystic fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis, COPD. Uh, again, specifically with the oxygen transportation uh, systems, uh, cardiac causes. Uh, so you want to ask specific symptoms about chest pain, um, palpitations or funny heartbeats, as well as if they have any dizziness, lightheaded syncope uh, history. Uh, and then again, the blood causes with common one being iron deficiency anemia, where you're not able to transport enough oxygen to meet the demand of uh, your exercise. Um, more rare cause with the working muscles, but if you have that early fatigue or myasthenia gravis, muscular dystrophy, uh, and some mitochondrial diseases. Uh, and again, with your physical exam, looking at structural causes, uh, so checking for scoliosis, if they have a large curve, kind of around 60 degrees or so, you start thinking about that pulmonary uh, compromise, as well as pectus cavus, where the front of the chest might go in and again have some um, dysfunction with the breathing. We're also looking for any somatic dysfunctions around the uh, rib cage can also be uh, contributing. Uh, deconditioning is also a consideration. Uh, it doesn't have to have a specific pathology underneath, but they might have, this would be kind of towards the end of exercise, you're having uh, issues with your breathing, maybe even kind of some muscle fatigue associated with it. And then we always want to clue into also uh, psychological causes. Um, so again, there might not be a necessary pathology underlying, but this is where the history with key focus on questions to see, does it happen all the time with exercise? Is it just happening uh, with competition where there might be more stress and you're okay when you're working out individually or practices? Um, so good things to remember. And we'll talk about some of these with these specific history questions. Um, and you want to start with the open-ended questions to get a little bit more idea, see if they can describe or characterize what they're feeling a little bit better. Uh, a little bit better. So asking them to describe what their breathing feels like. Uh, and then are they having symptoms uh, just with exercise? Uh, do they also have symptoms maybe at nighttime with other triggers, with seasonal changes or illnesses? Uh, what other associated symptoms they have with cluing in on those cardiovascular causes, again, with the chest pain, palpitations, syncope, um, get into a little bit of timing specific. So how long into exercise do these symptoms start to appear? Is it beginning in the first couple minutes when they really start the intense exercises? Uh, is it more when they're doing endurance or is it just kind of at the end when they're uh, overall fatigued or, or tired? And when they stop the exercise, how long does it take them to recover? Is it immediate recovery and they're breathing normally again? Does it take a couple minutes or even a couple hours or linger into the next day? And find out uh, specific environments or maybe even triggers. Uh, so does it happen indoors versus outdoors? Um, does it happen around any kind of seasonal or weather changes into the winter or the spring, the fall? Uh, and again, to cluing in if there's any specific instances with, does it just happen during uh, games, is it happening during practice or both, uh, can kind of tease apart and really focus on uh, some of the psychological aspects that may or may not be uh, involved. And then uh, moving on to the physical exam. So just one slide on this. I don't want to downplay because it's very important, but in things that we deal with that are exercise induced, a lot of times when we're seeing athletes or patients in the office, uh, they're going to have a normal exam at that point. And that might, you might be benefit uh, if you are doing any sideline coverage out during practices or having very good communication with your athletic trainer that might be able to pull in some of that detail uh, and clarification. But with this, starting with your um, head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat exam, you want to make sure that they have a patent uh, nares and pharynx, no obstructions you can see, uh, no erythema or extrates that might be kind of a viral illness consideration, um, and even checking for allergy or um, allergic uh, symptoms. So if they have cobblestoning in the back of their nares, uh, the allergic salute from kind of rubbing their nose up all the time and having a crease here, uh, seeing if they have any kind of sinus uh, tenderness or contributions uh, for kind of above the, the airways. Uh, making sure you're doing a thorough cardiac and pulmonary exam. Uh, so looking, listening to the heart uh, as well as kind of with doing different maneuvers, whether it's a valsalva, squatting and standing. Um, obviously listening to the lungs and doing a pulmonary exam from the front and back to make sure you're hearing good airflow throughout. They don't have any restrictions or any areas uh, 
um, that you can appreciate might not be moving air or having that exchange as well. Uh, and the musculoskeletal exam that we talked about, make sure they're check on their muscle tone, check for scoliosis, any kind of spine or rib cage pathology that um, could be there as well. Uh, and then when we hear these symptoms a lot of times, we want to jump to asthma. Asthma is very common, um, but these complaints do not always fit perfectly into asthma, and that's what we'll talk about some overlap in uh, other considerations today. And we make sure when we think this and don't just throw inhalers at everyone, uh, that can be kind of a gut reaction at time. Uh, but if you do that, make sure you're following up because sometimes uh, the medications can be uh, overused, underused. We don't want to medicate people that we don't need to, uh, but we also want to make sure we're treating them properly because if they're doing the inhaler and they're using it properly and they're not getting better, you might want to think about the other causes that we talked about, not necessarily um, from a pulmonary standpoint. But with that in mind, asthma is very common, uh, and so that's going to be our first one that we discussed today. Uh, so asthma is defined as a com complex lung disorder uh, with multiple different characteristics. Uh, so it's variable, so it doesn't necessarily just have to occur with um, exercise. There can be other uh, triggers and symptoms, and the symptoms kind of reoccur. A uh, big component is it is reversible, and we'll talk about that with testing. Uh, so it's an airway obstruction, uh, having difficulty with getting air out of your lungs uh, with different medications that it can improve and reverse um, our measurements. Uh, but underlying, there is some baseline airway inflammation. Um, that occurs that contributes to the obstruction with getting the air out, uh, as well as this uh, bronchial hyper responsiveness to a variety of stimuli, not just the exercise. And overall, it is a chronic disease that can uh, be lingering and affect people for their, their lifetimes. Uh, so background a little bit, asthma is thought to um, affect between five to 15% of the general population uh, with that exercise as being the most common trigger for these bronchial hyper-responsive events, somewhere in the range between 50 to 90% of asthmatics um, will be triggered by exercise. But there's also other causes that we want to uh, be aware about, uh, and that can be different stimuli, whether it's um, allergens such as pollen or pet dander, um, if you have any respiratory irritants, smoke, pollution, um, if you have any infectious disease, kind of winter time with viral um, URIs that can uh, cause this hyper responsiveness to come, and then different environments that happens kind of in dry or cold air. Uh, symptoms that people usually present with are going to be wheezing, tightness down in the chest, they might have some coughing, uh, it's important to differentiate again because it's a variable condition. It doesn't always happen with exercise. Nighttime symptoms can be a big trigger for kind of this hyper response to these symptoms uh, in athletes and patients. And then because it is reversible, knowing that it can improve with bronchodilator. So if you do use that as your first line measure for treatment before diagnostics, uh, making sure they are improving and doing better with that. Uh, so the diagnosis really triggers on uh, three things, your history and physical, doing pulmonary function tests and exclusion of any alternative diagnoses that we kind of covered with other lung, lung or cardiopulmonary uh, considerations. So with the testing that you do, the pulmonary function tests are the mainstay for the diagnosis uh, and checking in. Um, and spirometry is being the primary source of that. And when you're doing the spirometry, there's two different uh, categories that you were looking at. Uh, one is your forced vital capacity or FVC. And this is how much breath you can expire from your lungs after taking a maximal ins inspiration. Uh, and then you're comparing that with your FEV1 or forced exhaled volume within one second. Uh, and this ratio we'll look at for the airway obstructions at the bottom of the screen is you're looking at your FEV1 over your FVC. And this kind of tells you the uh, percent of air that's emptied uh, totally within the body within that first second that you can really expel out hard on your own. Uh, and if this is less than 80% of predicted, of predicted, that's when you want to consider uh, obstructive airway causes with asthma uh, being one of those. And here's a picture, uh, most people might be familiar, but you kind of have this, this tube and uh, attached to a uh, monitor that's measuring the airflow, how much you can totally breathe out, as well as how much is captured within that, that first second. And so the spirometry, the, the results we get will come up in a flow volume loop, which are down at the bottom here. Uh, but to have the diagnosis for asthma, because it again is a reversible condition. So when we give a bronchodilator, such as the Saba or the short-acting beta agonist, uh, your albuterol inhalers, 
uh, you want to see an improvement of 12% with that FEV1. So you want to see a 12% increase in volume that you can expel from your lungs within that first uh, second. And so when we look at the um, two graphs on the bottom, the one on the left has volume over time. So if you look over at the uh, x-axis for that first second and compare going up, you can see that the pre-bronchodilators on the bottom and the post-bronchodilators bronchodilators on the top and see that there is an increase in that total volume that's been expelled in that first second. Uh, and for this, it's uh, labeled as 13%, uh, which would be consistent with that asthma. Uh, and then we have the loop. So we have flow over volume here. Uh, and where they're pointing, I'm assuming is around the, the first second. And you're looking at the total area under the curve here for that kind of volume that's expelled. And again, the higher curve here being that post bronco uh, dilator phase uh, and seeing that more air and volume was expelled in that first second. Uh, so being able to be familiar with those uh, charts as well as really knowing, especially for testing, that greater than 12% um, increase in your FEV1 after a bronco dilator uh, when doing spirometry is consistent with an asthma diagnosis if that's on your differential. Uh, but spirometry can be um, equivocal sometimes, and if you still have a strong suspicion uh, that the athlete or patient has asthma, there are some alternative diagnostic testing that we can do. Uh, this one is called a methylene, methylcholine challenge test, uh, and this uses uh, muscarinic receptors to trigger smooth muscle contraction within the bronchioles and the uh, airways, uh, and this is supposed to trigger kind of that hyper-responsive um, event and that kind of caused that airway obstruction with breathing out. And here again, you're looking at that force expired volume within one second, and you're expected to see a drop of more than 20% uh, in individuals with airway hyperresponsiveness. Uh, so when we talk about this test, it's very sensitive because uh, it's very likely that individuals with asthma will have a response and have this reduction, uh, but it's not very specific because we're still doing, um, having an irritant into the airway so people that even don't have underlying asthma might still develop a hyper-responsive uh, constriction just because of the medication. Uh, so it's not as sensitive and we'll pick up people that don't necessarily have asthma, but still have a positive test. Uh, we go next, we kind of look at the overview here, and this kind of takes you through the flow chart, starting with your concern for asthma uh, and then obtaining your pulmonary function test with the baseline numbers that we talked about. Uh, one thing that is added on here um, that they talk about, again, if you're having kind of equivocal um, diagnostics tests is some people will use uh, peak flow volumes, uh, and they'll test this about three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening over a two week period to see how much variability someone might have with their peak flow. And again, with asthma, we talk about, um, you know, sometimes being fine, sometimes having these exacerbations and then this fluctuation in how much you can expel within the peak flow. Um, so if that is positive with greater than 20% variability, um, then you can diagnose asthma just with uh, those testing. Um, so again, the big numbers to remember for testing, if you're doing the spirometry, uh, post bronchodilator and a more than 12% increase in your FEV1 um, versus if you're just checking variability with peak flows over a two week period, uh, greater than 20% variability. And again, 20% if you're doing the methylcholine challenge test where you'll see a um, drop in your FEV1. So really knowing about the FEV1 and having those numbers uh, in your mind can be helpful. Uh, and moving on to how asthma is classified. Um, and this is done by symptom frequency and exacerbations. Uh, so there's four different classifications with intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, and severe persistent. Um, a lot of times people get confused and a lot of uh, tests tied to differentiate the giving a vignette between the intermittent and mild persistent symptoms. And that's where the rule of two comes in. Uh, so for the intermittent asthma classification, you're going to see less than two, two um, symptoms less than two days a week, as well as nighttime symptoms less than two times a month. Uh, compared, if you advance to the mild persistent, then it's going to happen more than two days a week, more than two uh, nights a month, and you're going to be using your uh, albuterol or controller inhaler a little bit more. Uh, but then when you start talking about daily symptoms um, or symptoms, 
one night a week of having nighttime symptoms is when you move into the moderate persistent category. And this is with the daily symptoms you might be using your albuterol or rescular inhaler um, every day. And then the last category is the severe persistent. And this is happening throughout the day, uh, frequent kind of even nightly um, symptoms of asthma. And you're kind of needing more help than you can get just with the albuterol and sometimes even controller medications. Um, so again, having this classification in mind, remembering the rule two of two specifically for the intermittent and mild persistent symptoms. Uh, and another two that is thrown in there at the bottom of the screen is if you do have more than, despite what your symptom classification is, more than two exacerbations in a year that require oral steroids to help control, you fall into the at least mild persistent category. Um, and with that, when we talk about asthma treatment, uh, it's usually broken into two different levels with uh, relievers, which is your short acting beta agonist. And that's usually your albuterol um, inhaler with the brand names of kind of Ventolin and Proair versus, and those are just used as, as needed when symptom develops or sometimes will people, athletes wear a pre-medicate before exercise uh, compared to your controller medicines uh, that you might be using every day. The first line usually being those inhaled corticosteroids, so Flovent, Pulmacort, Qvar are common ones. Uh, if you need to escalate from that, there are the long-acting beta agonists, um, but you want to be clued into this uh, in a common question. You don't want to use a LABA or a long-acting beta agonist as monotherapy. Uh, studies have shown that it actually increases your risk for acute exacerbations if it's used alone. So if you are considering using a LABA medication, make sure they have another controller medication, typically inhaled uh, corticosteroid um, with that because the combination of those, those two is safe and uh, effective. Uh, other medication considerations are the leukotriene modifiers. Uh, this is a good bridge for those uh, asthmatic athletes that also have some allergy symptoms because it helps kind of control both of those. So Montelukastor Singular is an example of that. Um, and if you do need additional me medicine on top of this, sometimes long-acting uh, anti-muscarinic um, inhalers uh, are beneficial to decrease some of that smooth muscle contraction and uh, hyper-responsiveness that contributes to the um, airway obstruction. And so when you talk about how do you treat which uh, inhaler do you usually true, uh, choose, there's this nice kind of six-step um, continuum that you can reference and use. And the steps typically go through, at least at the beginning, uh, correlate well with the uh, symptom classification. So with step one, um, just being your albuterol or short acting beta agonist inhaler as needed. Um, and that's consistent with the intermittent classification. When you move on to the mild persistent classification, you're jumping up to kind of step two. Uh, and that's when you might add on a low dose inhaled corticosteroid. Um, and this will be, again, that daily controller medication in addition to using the um, albuterol inhaler as needed. If that's still not getting you an, enough control, um, you move on to step three, and then you talk about um, either increasing the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid you're on or adding on uh, a dual therapy, and that's when you can add on that long-acting beta agonist because uh, you're using it in conjunction with the inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, moving on from there, if you do need to go to step four and that's still not giving you enough control, that's when you're talking about like the leukotriene receptor antagonist uh, and other medications. If you do get up to step five and six uh, and having a really difficult time uh, controlling, that's when you might want to get a referral to a, a pulmonologist because uh, there are some different uh, immune modifiers that people can use that have been shown to help with um, the difficult to control asthmatics. But in all of this, remember that it's not, this is your classification, this is your treatment. It is a continuum depending on exercise level, the seasons, people's symptoms are available, will be variable. Um, so checking whether it is every three months or so, seeing what their symptoms level are. If they are controlled, not having exacerbations, can you stay at that level or can you deescalate and lose a medication and kind of reassess after that? Or if they're still describing symptoms and you don't feel they're very well controlled, moving up to that next step. Um, so it's not like someone is pigeonholed into a specific treatment plan for the year or for their lifetime. It, it should be a fluid situation that you're constantly um, assessing and checking in with their asthma action plan. Um, going on to that, and the last thing I wanted to talk about 
uh, with treatment is education with that continuum. So whether it's the athletes, parents, even coaches, school all know, uh, and having a physical asthma action plan is very helpful when it tells you, hey, these are my symptoms, these are when I don't feel controlled, what can I do or what are the next steps that I, I need to take uh, is very helpful and having that education piece. So the athlete, as well as those who are involved and care for the athlete, um, are aware of and can help facilitate, but you also know kind of those no next steps, what might be your triggers uh, and how to manage your symptoms and condition a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, and then moving on to exercise induced bronchoconstriction. Uh, and so we have this chart here to show that there is a lot of overlap between the, the two conditions. Um, they are both kind of bronchial hyper-responsive diseases, and they can happen in tandem or, or coexist together, but also people can have asthma as an individual entity, as well as EIB as an individual entity, uh, and there'll be differentiation, differentiations that we can talk about. Um, main ones being asthma, again, is a variable condition and can happen outside of uh, just exercise, and there is a baseline inflammation that's associated with it versus the EIB uh, is really just associated with exercise. Uh, so at baseline, they will have normal pulmonary functions, normal lung volumes, uh, but when they exercise, that's when they can uh, get those symptoms and get kind of those decreases. Uh, and so we talk about definition of exercise-induced bronchoconstriction is acute airway narrowing that occur occurs as a result of exercise. So this is transient and reversible as well, uh, but exercise is the only trigger for this. Uh, and again, it can occur in individuals without asthma. Um, so it is its own standalone uh, entity. And we'll talk about kind of the um, workup as well as treatment for uh, prevalence. So again, it, they can coexist together a lot between EIB and asthma, and it's thought that uh, up to 90% of asthmatics have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, um, which makes sense with exercise being the most common trigger for these hyper-responsiveness in uh, asthmatics. Um, in the general population, the prevalence is thought to be somewhere between 5 to 20%, uh, but it is has been studied and found to be much higher in elite athletes. Uh, especially with Olympic athletes, prevalence a wide range, but somewhere between 30 to 70 percent, uh, and highest in kind of these winter athletes and swimmers, um, which we'll talk about now in the environments that they um, live in. So a couple of different studies that tried to uh, differentiate the um, prevalence. So around 30 percent of people that looked into ice rink athletes, and again, this is in an indoor environment. Um, there's going to be dry air. There may even be kind of pollutants or different triggers, uh, whether it's the Zamboni machine or kind of machinery in that's within the closed environment. Uh, when you talk about swimmers, they're also in this enclosed environment, um, especially during the winter months. But even the pool, the treatments that we have with different uh, chlorination products can trigger some of the, the pathology that we will we'll talk about. Um, and a studies have found somewhere between 11 to 29 percent of swimmers um, had this condition. Again, we talk about Nordic skiers as well as distance runners. So now we're getting into some endurance population. Uh, and these are people who might be outside for long periods of time, uh, as well, especially with the Nordic skiers and kind of um, the winter cold environments, that air can be a big trigger to have these um, hyper-responsive events. And we'll talk about the, the pathophysiology with this. But these higher level athletes, and the thought is they are exerting themselves uh, very much to an elite level, and this kind of triggers the increase in ventilation as well as the pathology postulated to be uh, contributing to the exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. Um, so here, when we talk about um, the proposed pathology, it's thought that with this increase in minute ventilation, you're having more uh, air and heat exchange within the bronchioles, and this causes a change in your osmotic gradient, gradient and can kind of lice or injure cells, which then release this inflammatory cascade uh, and mediators that trigger smooth muscle and kind of obstruction within the airways. Um, so then it becomes difficult to breathe that air out. Uh, and with this different irritants that we talked about, whether it's in the indoor ice rink environments, in the swimmers with the chemicals, or even those kind of endurance outdoor athletes that might be running within the cities with pollutions or air quality uh, might be additional triggers um, 
along with the thought of this dehydration uh, of the airways. Because when you're breathing, again, with the rapid exchange or pulling in uh, cold or dry air within kind of the warm, mus um, moist em environment of your bronchioles, and this causes a big kind of, again, heat and uh, water exchange that can dehydrate, injure the cells, and start this cascade uh, of obstructions and developing symptoms for the athlete while they're exercising. So presentation can be um, quite similar to asthma, and that's why just focusing on the subjective symptoms is not always uh, the best and clue you into what's going on. And we'll talk about the uh, diagnostic workup for this, but whether it's wheezing, chest tightness or pain, cough, and talked about a locker room cough that's just kind of, I just get this cough after I exercise, you know, I go home, I don't have it anymore, doesn't bother me except uh, after my exercise periods. Uh, shortness of breath, increased mucus production that happens with the passophysiology and kind of cell injury we talked about. Uh, and then over the more vague uh, complaints being lower exercise tolerance or decreased performance. Um, and then with this, the clue when we get back to history um, and asking about the different timing and occurrences that happen because the exercise induced um, bronchoconstriction has a fairly consistent presentation with people. And so when we talk about the timing, whenever you get into uh, more intense uh, exercise, symptoms usually begin two to five minutes uh, after that brief ex um, intense exercise. Uh, will peak about 10 minutes, but then when you stop or calm down with your exercise, everything resolves kind of usually typically within 60 minutes, but can go up to uh, 90 minutes post activity. And that's what we talk about kind of the locker room symptoms or cough. Um, but when they would kind of leave that environment getting better. Um, and again, this is a concern a lot for athletes in our care because this causes a decrease in performance uh, and might actually cause people to avoid these high intense um, activities because it triggers the symptoms. So they might be finding alternative sports or, or other activities. Um, and so the diagnosis with this, um, just going on symptoms alone is typically not enough. So we want to make sure there are some diagnostic ways that we can pinpoint uh, and confirm this as our diagnostic. And these are the objective measurements that we're going to uh, talk about. Again, the FEV1 or forced expiratory volume within one second is a big classification like we talked about with asthma that will help diagnose our EIB. Uh, and it shows to have better repeatability some, than some other tests. Um, we talk about the variability with asthma and using those peak flow rates uh, at different time points during the day, not as successful with this condition because it only again happens with exercise. So usually baseline lung function and peak flows will be uh, normal when they're not kind of exercising or having that trigger. Uh, and the number that we look for this diagnosis is um, greater than a 10% decrease and your FEV1 uh, within 30 minutes after exercise. And we'll talk about the um, diagnostic testing for this now. Uh, the main one, which I think intuitively makes sense is an exercise challenge test because this is the trigger for the exercise induced uh, bronchoconstrictions. Uh, so you can see at the picture on the below, below here, um, it does involve some equipment. So usually people are exerting themselves, whether it's on, there's different protocols for on a bike, on a treadmill, on an uh, ergonometer, uh, but you're hooked up with this mask that's again giving this dry air and it's about, um, should be consistent around 5% of CO2 or carbon dioxide. Um, Cause we think about that dry air um, going back to that water and heat exchange within the bronchioles being the root cause of that um, pathophysiology. And so when you do this, you're gonna very quickly increase your exercise to get to uh, an intense activity. While you're doing this, you're breathing in everything from the mask and you're hooked up to a computer screen where you can test kind of the spirometry and your numbers again. So you're going to have your baseline value um, and that's going to give you your baseline FEV1. The main goal in doing this exercise is to increase that baseline to around 17.5 to 21% um, higher and you're going to try and sustain this for four to six minutes. Uh, and after doing that, you're going to test your FEV1 at 5, 10, 15, uh, and 30 minutes after activity. And with those testings, you want to see two different measurements of your FEV1 decrease by more than 10% uh, to solidify the diagnosis uh, of EI EIB. Uh, but as you can imagine, getting up to 20 times your FEV1 baseline uh, 
uh, and doing that for six minutes is very demanding because you'll have um, uh, it's very challenging to to do that but again goes into that quick intense activity uh, to trigger these symptoms and see what happens when you stop uh, exercise to check those feb ones and uh, compare and contrast to the baseline uh, if you don't have the uh, exercise testing and the cardiopulmonary exercise testing available, uh, there are some surrogate testings uh, that has been accepted. Um, the most common one is something called eucapnic voluntary hyperpnea, or EVH. Uh, and this is a similar test, but instead of actually having the athlete or individual exercise, they just use uh, hyperventilation uh, as the trigger. So again, with this, you're hooked up to a mask. Uh, and you have your computerized um, readings to have your FEV1, FEV1 measurements to compare. Uh, but this time again, you're breathing in that dry air uh, with 5% carbon dioxide, uh, and you're gonna hyperventilate yourself for six minutes. And your goal from comparing your baseline FEV1, you're gonna try and ventilate 22 to 30 times your baseline. So you're gonna imagine, again, there's no exercise involved with this, but you're gonna be sitting there and really, <laughs> high ventilation rate for six minutes. Uh, so that's very demanding and that causes a lot of that uh, air exchange and it's in a very controlled environment because you have that mask with the dry air. Uh, and you're gonna see again, if this triggers that uh, bronchial hyper response just with that ventilatory exchange. Uh, and after doing this, you're gonna check your spirometry one, three, five, 10 and 20 minutes afterwards. And again, you're looking for a vault um, a greater than 10% uh, decrease in your FEV1 after doing this um, intervention with the hyperventilation. Uh, and studies have shown that this is very reproducible. It's well standardized. Uh, and this is a diagnostic test that the uh, IOC or International Olympic Committee will accept um, for EIB. And that becomes an important part we'll talk about with um, different medications that they might, the athlete might be prescribed. Um, to be treating with this. And especially it's important that the IOC has, um, has this in their differential because we saw before the prevalence, these elite athletes, these Olympians, there seems to be a higher prevalence. Um, so making sure they're properly diagnosed as well as treated so they can perform at their highest level. Um, so here's again, looking at the uh, flow chart of the um, eucapnic voluntary hyperpnea. Um, protocol. And we just talked about the single step protocol over here. Uh, I like this chart because it does also give some guidance if you are medicated um, before going through this diagnostic testing. It gives you the timeline, whether it's hours or days that you need to be off medication uh, to get the best results and reproducibility with um, this challenge. Uh, but also people who might have um, asthma associated with this, other pulmonary or respiratory conditions. There is a STEP protocol uh, that uses a lower percent of your maximal voluntary ventilation. That's what the MVV over here is for, um, starting at 30%, 60%, and 90%, going up as the athlete or, or patient tolerates, and rechecking those spirometries with the same um, baseline numbers of seeing a greater than 10% uh, decrease in the uh, FEV1. Uh, the severity here, again, is best based on the FEV1, mild being between 10 to 25%, moderate 25 to 50%, and severe greater than 50%. Uh, but there is a caveat to the severe if they are pre-medicated with corticosteroids, which is one of the treatments. Uh, if there's a more than 30% decrease in the FEV1, that can also be characterized into the severe category. Um, with that, there's some other tests that aren't necessarily involved with that ventilation um, or exercise. Uh, these ones are not really as reproducible and accepted, uh, but it is uh, breathing in some hyper uh, osmolar solution um, to again trigger that um, bronchial spasm um, result to obstruct the airway as well as kind of after exercising, checking if there's any elevated uh, nitric oxide um, that's being inhaled. Um, and these again are not, are talked about briefly, but not really diagnostic and not accepted um, to confirm the diagnosis of EIB. And then we talk about treatments. Uh, again, education about this is a, a big component because a lot of times people, as long as they know, figure out their tr triggers, they can uh, modify their activities 
and perform well without any specific medication interventions. Uh, and this is really talked about doing um, interval or sprint activities before you know you have a practice game competition. Um, doing this, figuring out you know how long it takes you to do if I do intense exercise or sprint training, you know, 10 to 15 minutes in that activity, I'm going to have these symptoms come on. Uh, and then if I stop the activity, will it get better 20 minutes, an hour? But knowing that, because a lot of times people will go into a refractory period for about two hours after having that initial insult, uh, where as long as they can plan that, time it, have that happen, they can go into their competition uh, knowing that they're not going to have a trigger to these symptoms and have uh, fine performance moving forward. Um, especially with the uh, pathophysiology thought with the dehydration of the cells. Um, as people warm up and exercise, there is a thought that using um, a mask to kind of warm or humidify the air, uh, that we might kind of have a better idea now with what we're doing with the coronavirus and our, our mask lies, but you can kind of feel how warm that air gets and might limit kind of the heat exchange that happens uh, down in your bronchioles to uh, stop that uh, obstruction and inflammatory cascade from happening. But this is a, a weaker recommendation compared to that um, interval training for the refractory period. Other weaker recommendations here at the bottom are some dietary modifications, whether it's uh, low salt diet, fish oil, um, or other anti-inflammatories um, are something you can try but don't have a lot of recommendation um, behind them. When you get to the pharmacologic or medication treatment for EIB, um, the initial and mainstay is using that short-acting beta agonist uh, before exercise. Um, so just like asthma, kind of using it as needed. Uh, and there's a strong recommendation and good evidence that this is beneficial. Um, but it works for two to four hours, so planning it around the timing. And if you start using it uh, too frequently, you can get taxiflaxis, which is where you build up a tolerance to the medication and it no longer helps dilate the smooth muscles and it's not as effective. So even though you're using the medication, the symptoms can still occur. And that's when, if that is happening, you feel you're using it daily or very frequently, making sure you're adding on a more of a, a controller medication. Um, and that's when we talk about, again, the inhaled character corticosteroids being a strong recommendation uh, to start as the controller medication in addition to the albuterol as needed. Um, the long-acting beta agonist can also be used, but again, not as monotherapy for this. Uh, Leukotriene receptor antagonists uh, are also helpful for this condition, uh, as well as more of the mast cell stabilizing agents like chromalin can be used as needed before exercise to limit the uh, mast cell um, trigger for that inflammatory response. Um, so those are all important things to remember with the um, recommendations attached uh, to counsel your athletes if doing the non-pharmacologic measures are not uh, enough. And here is uh, a lot of what we talked about in a, a chart or picture form um, for reference later on. Um, and that covers the asthma and EIB. Also wanted to touch very briefly on exercise-induced uh, laryngeal obstruction. Um, this is sometimes commonly uh, confused with vocal cord dysfunction, uh, but that's not as much of the inclusive term. The vocal cords are part of the, the larynx and they can have the dysfunction, uh, but a lot of times it'll actually happen higher up in the supraglottic airways. Uh, and not necessarily affect the vocal cords. So having EILO is a more inclusive and may be a better um, terminology for the exact pathophysiology going on. Uh, but it's defined overall as abnormal closure of your supraglottic or glottic levels of the larynx. This typically happens during inspiration. Uh, so sometimes you can trigger out from the history, the asthma and EIB will be an obstructive airway um, disease where it's difficult to get air out. This is more um, a restrictive where you're having a hard time um, with inspiration or getting air in. Uh, backgrounds thought to be around 5% of the athletic uh, population. And again, this can happen, uh, coexist with asthma or EIB or be its own solo entity uh, as well. It's more common in females. And the thought behind that is they have shorter, more narrow um, larynxes that might kind of contribute to the paradoxical closing. Um, which happens in this picture, again, focusing on the vocal cords, but usually when you're breathing in, normally the vocal cords should uh, abduct or open up so that air exchange can happen. But for this, for a reason, they are paradoxically closed and really limit that uh, air exchange. Uh, there's also more common in adolescents as well as um, type A 
uh, personalities have been had to have a higher prevalence of this. Uh, presentation, they have shortness of breath. Here they might have the inspiratory strider where they're breathing in and having a hard time uh, and differentiating from the breathing out conditions. Shortness of breath, they might instead of the chest tightness, more tightness up in their throat, have a choking sensation, or even describe as transient dysphonia or change uh, vocal cord or voice changes uh, whenever they're symptomatic. The timing of this is important because that can help differentiate what might be going on. Again, with exercise-induced bronchoconstrictions, it's most severe five to 10 minutes after having that intense exercise, Why EILL will occur during exercise uh, and will quickly resolve usually within five minutes once you stop um, exercising. Uh, again, doing a quick look at flow volume loops. We talked before about the um, expiratory causes of the one on top. Uh, peaking. And now for this, because it's more of an inspiratory um, pathology, the uh, below curved or uh, uh, convex shape of a normal inspiration is really blunted or flat because you're not getting as much air through uh, that obstructions that's happening uh, within the larynx. Um, so it's much shorter and you can see those uh, pictured and sometimes on um, tests and CAQs as well. So the diagnosis of this is direct visualization of everything going on. So people will do a uh, continuous laryngeal endoscopy or exercise induced uh, laryngoscope where they'll have this um, fancy contraption down at the bottom where they'll actually have uh, the laryngeal scope go through their, their nares down to the larynx uh, where they can visualize everything going on um, and it's attached to the head so they can still move, run, exercise to induce the triggers. And you want to make sure you're looking at kind of the, the supraglottic, glottic, and subglottic levels to see where the pathology really going on, if it's happening when they're breathing in, where they're breathing out, um, and how long it happens into and after exercise. So this can give you, it's a, a difficult test, uh, can be hard to find, but can give you a lot of good information. Uh, the treatment for this is really focused around kind of speech and behavioral therapy. So doing a lot of larynx exercises and strengthening, uh, diaphragmatic breathing, uh, sometimes people will try neuromodulating medications such as gabapentin or Lyrica. Uh, supraglottic injections like Botox has also been tried to stop that uh, closure or abduction of the, the larynx from happening. But really, uh, the breathing process, visualization, psychotherapy to get some biofeedback control um, is helpful for these um, athletes and treat the condition. Uh, with that, you also want to, with all these consider, um, conditions, consider allergies as a um, complicating um, etiology as well, and whether they're going to have sinus tenderness, congestion, eustachian tube dysfunction. Um, you can treat this as well, recommending nasal saline rinses to clear out any kind of pollutants, irritants that might be in the sinuses, as well as antihistamines um, to help treat. Um, overall take home points um, is make sure you're taking a good history for sometimes these vague complaints uh, and the more specifics you can get, especially within those exercise timing can help pinpoint um, the pathology that might be going on and work up the um, evaluation and diagnostic testing. Um, diagnosis for these because symptoms are, are so similar is very unreliable. So making sure that you can confirm with objective testing that we talked about. Uh, and it's important to be able to identify these so we can properly treat them and get the athletes back to uh, their well-being as well as their performance. Uh, and knowing that asthma and exercise-induced bronchoconstriction are not the same entity and can happen together as well as on their own. Uh, and the diagnosis are really based on feb ones with asthma being greater than 12% increase after a bronchodilator and EIB being a decrease greater than 10% uh, within 30 minutes after stopping exercise. Um, so that brings the uh, end to my talk. So thank you for entertaining me and I hope it was helpful uh, and educational. Uh, you can reach out to me individually with my email as well. And I think um, we're available for some questions afterwards as well. Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, again, this is, uh... This is uh, Dr. Nye Nate and I coming back on, and um, I am going to go ahead and uh, step in as moderator. I would love to uh, invite questions from anyone on the on the uh, on the call today to submit uh, anything you may be thinking about, any um, unresolved questions or clinical challenges you may have run into. Uh, please go ahead and submit those questions through the chat function, and I will uh, see those come in, and I will. Uh, make sure that those questions get uh, up to our speaker.
um, while you all are um, on the line and thinking about what questions you might like to ask, uh, Jeff, would you mind talking about um, any considerations for the use of um, you know, medications in our collegiate athletes and um, you know, do they need therapeutic use exemptions for any of these medications that we're talking about for people with asthma and um, any other considerations for uh, collegiate athletes with uh, dyspnea? Yeah, so I think from a, a medication standpoint, um, I believe most of the inhaled medications when you're talking about the albuterol or um, the short acting beta agonists, as well as the inhaled corticosteroids, uh, are fine for treatments and don't need the um, TUEs or therapeutic use exceptions. Uh, I believe that is also consistent with um, Olympic guidelines, but if you are escalating care above that or taking anything or orally instead of inhaled, uh, then you do need to have uh, an exception, um, exempt section filled out, therapeutic um, form filled out for that. Um, and the other point is, uh, with that, especially when you're talking about the elite athletes, uh, and that's why we tried to stress the diagnostic diagnostic component um, to have that as proof of, you know, this is confirmed their underlying condition, uh, and these are the uh, appropriate treatments. Because uh, sometimes in literature is kind of back and forth if there is some sort of performance enhancement uh, by taking the albuterol or um, inhaled corticosteroids. Um, so having that diagnosis can be helpful and uh, not necessarily lead you into uh, confusions or, or roadblocks. Great. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, we have a question, a couple of questions coming in from the audience. Um, uh, both of them are related to the new GINA uh, guidelines. And uh, so two people are asking, um, have you considered uh, changing or uh, to the new 20, to the 2019 2020 guidelines which move away from a short acting beta agonist and instead using a first line treatment with inhaled corticosteroids slash LABA. Um, and this uh, other question is uh, for mild intermittent asthma using um, these LABAs instead of SABAs for those over 12 years old for EIB. Or should we still consider short-acting beta agonist as first line for EIB? Yeah, so I think those are great points. And I think it really comes down to uh, your conversation and decision with the, the patients and athletes uh, on how they would like to treat or approach their condition. Um, you know, typically it is that stepwise approach that we talked about with using the as-needed uh, SABA first. Um, but there is more... Um, evidence and um, thoughts and suggestions that using the uh, inhaled corticosteroid uh, from a baseline perspective can uh, help with the consistency as well as help with the um, underlying etiology, the hyper responsiveness, and really get into more of the small airway diseases that might be contributing um, to the symptoms that are harder to test. We didn't get into that, to that today. Um, but sometimes looking outside the FEV1, especially with our athletic population, uh, with FEV kind of 25 to 50, so that mid-range or smaller airway disease, uh, it's thought that the inhaled corticosteroid um, being on a consistent basis would help that more. Um, so I think those are all good and interesting points, but then it comes back to, you know, how I would have the conversation with an athlete. Do you want to take this medication every day? or are you comfortable with your symptoms around to just use it as needed, pre-medicate before exercise uh, and kind of move on from there and see how they're doing. Follow, make sure you follow up to see how they're doing because you can always change or revert back at, at that point. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. I'm um, looking at uh, another question that I would like to uh, ask you about is, um, how do you think asthma affects the psychology of an athlete? And do you think that's significant is, um, you know, does anxiety play into this either as a result or as a cause of their symptoms? And should we be mindful of uh, perhaps uh, some of those kinds of factors as we're taking a history and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, from a pathology standpoint, especially when we're talking about the EILO, um, you know, that anxiety, mental, psychological component uh, is thought to be a, a big trigger. Uh, 
Um, but I think the same can be um, considered for asthma as well as EIB if they kind of know their triggers and kind of have had bad experiences, their anxiety, their expectation, uh, I do believe could uh, make things worse. Uh, and that's where having that educational component uh, and that short-term follow-up to see, you know, where you are on the continuum, are you feeling controlled, is this helping, um, to see if, A, is it the medication they're responding to it, uh, and they actually have an underlying disorder, or is it more the medication is not even helping and you need to look at different avenues outside of respiratory or even just focus potentially on the, the psychological aspects, um, which can be a big contributor. And you know, we kind of talked about if that's more of the stress competition induced field um, than when you kind of practice or individual exercising. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much we could talk about here. I, um, this is a big topic and you've done a beautiful job covering a lot of uh, depth and breadth. And um, I'm sure we could go on and talk for several hours about all the different aspects. Uh, given that it is uh, one o'clock, at least here on the East Coast, uh, I think we'll hang it up for today. I don't see any more questions coming in from the group, but um, once again, big thank you to Dr. Dreyer and um, a, a virtual round of applause for, uh, for him for, for speaking to us today. And uh, this will go up on the AMSSM YouTube channel. So this will be available virtually asynchronously. And um, yes, uh, I, once again, a reminder to uh, fill out the feedback form. There's a SurveyMonkey link, which Andy Meyer shared on the chat feed. So we, we highly appreciate those. And um, uh, so do take a few minutes and go on and uh, click on the link, fill out our, uh, our uh, feedback survey. Uh, so again, this wraps up our AMSSM online lecture for today. And uh, we will look forward to our, our uh, talk. Uh, we do have another uh, speaker coming on next week. who will be talking about the female athlete triad. That will be Dr. Emily Krauss from Stanford. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dreyer. And thank you everyone for, uh, for attending today. Have a great rest of the day. We'll call it uh, a day here. All right. Thanks, everyone.